Good evening. My name is Susan Phillips, and I'm the Dean of the School of Business here at uh, the George Washington University. And I'm very pleased to welcome you uh, to our 11th annual Robert P. Uh, Maxson Lecture. Um, our program uh, is being recorded tonight, so before I proceed, I'd, I'd ask that you take this opportunity, uh, if you've not already done so, to uh, silence your cell phones and any other stray electronic devices you might have with you. Uh, let, me, let me begin by providing a little background on our event for tonight. For those of you who have attended previous lectures, you know that the uh, Maxson Lectureship was established through a gift, um, gift to the university by Mrs. Dorothy Maxson uh, in honor of her husband, Robert. Mr. Maxson was a highly decorated World War II uh, graduate of George Washington University. He got his degree here in 1948. He began his career in the energy field shortly after graduating, and over the course of his career, he worked in various locales around the world, including uh, Japan, uh, Indonesia, and India. Mr. Maxson retired as the general uh, manager for world, worldwide corporate public relations for the Mobile Oil Company in 1983. Mrs. Maxson wanted this lecture series to focus on international business in his honor. The topic for tonight's lecture concerns global accounting standards, and some might say that this is in fact a foundation for international business. In fact, the question of the relationship between U.S. generally accepted accounting principles, or GAAP, and the international financial reporting standards is one of the more interesting and pressing issues facing global investors, business managers, and financial regulators today. In addition, the recent financial crisis and proposals for reforms of financial markets have brought to public light questions about accounting standards, their implications for transparency of firm performance and risk. So now let's get to the business at hand. And we're fortunate tonight uh, not to have with us not just one, but two eminent figures currently helping to create a clearer path for accounting standards into the future. Robert Hertz is in his second term as chairman of the Financial Accounting Standards Board, having served in that capacity for eight years. Mr. Hurst uh, earned his BA in Economics at the University of Manchester, 1974. He is both a certified public accountant and a chartered accountant. He served on numerous finance and accounting boards and committees, including the AICPA SEC Regulations Committee and the Transnational Auditors Committee um, of the uh, International Federation of Accountants. The Financial Accounting Standards Board, or FASB, is overseen by the Financial Accounting Foundation and is responsible for issuing and maintaining the U.S. Generally Accepted Accounting Principles, or U.S. GAAP. They do so under authority designated by the Securities and Exchange Commission. Sir David Tweedy is chairman of the International Accounting Standards Board. Sir David got his undergraduate and doctoral degrees at Edinburgh University, uh, where he now serves as a visiting professor of accounting in the management school. In 1990, he was appointed the first full-time chairman of the then newly created Accounting Standards Board, the committee charged with the responsibility for producing the UK's accounting standards. He's been awarded honorary degrees by eight British universities, the ICAEW's Founding Society's Centenary Award for 1997, and the CIMA Award for 1998 for services uh, to the accounting profession. The International Accounting Standards Board, or IASB, 
is based in London and is responsible for oversight of the international financial reporting standards which are used in many countries around the world. Moderating our discussion tonight, we're fortunate to have with us Benjamin Applebaum. Mr. Applebaum is a financial journalist whose work includes the recent economic crisis as well as subsequent legislation and proposed financial regulation. His honors include the Gerald Loeb Award for Business and Financial Journalism, the George Polk Award for Economic Reporting, and recognition as a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for Public Service. He will soon join the New York Times this month as a domestic correspondent based in Washington. He was previously the national banking reporter at the Washington Post. He's a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania. I want to thank all three of our guests for being with us tonight. I'm sure this will be an interesting discussion. We have reserved some time for Q&A this evening. Uh, note cards are going to be ha are being handed out to you and um, for you to write, uh, write your questions on. And then our moderator will announce before he sort of gets to the final few of his questions uh, that it's time to submit your questions. And um, at that time, you can raise your cards. And Andrew, uh, and he's the one who's given out the cards now, uh, will uh, then collect your, uh, collect your cards. Uh, these will then be submitted to our moderator, who will put as many of the questions uh, to the speakers as we have time. So it's time to get on with the program. And as I turn uh, the floor over to our moderator, please join me in welcoming our 2009-10 Maxson lecturers. Gentlemen. So good evening. Welcome to all. Uh, to summarize the introduction, on my right we have the organization that sets accounting standards in more than 100 countries around the world. On my left, uh, an organization that sets accounting standards in the United States. And perhaps the place to begin, I know uh, we have varying levels of familiarity with, with uh, these bodies here tonight, uh, is just with uh, Bob, if you would, tell us a little bit about how that came to be the case. OK. Um, let me go back. Uh, about 35 years ago when both of our actually organizations were founded, although in David's case it was really a, a predecessor organization which then got reformed and we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, but both, both organizations were, were, were founded in the early 70s. Uh, the FASB and its parent organization, the Financial Accounting Foundation, uh, were founded really uh, to in the light of dissatisfaction with uh, standards being set really in kind of a closed door way largely by the accounting profession. It was viewed as not transparent, as not sufficiently independent and the like and uh, a study occurred and the uh, idea came up uh, that there ought to be an independent group of full-time people who uh, while their backgrounds might be in accounting and in finance and other realms uh, ought to independently set the, the standards. And that was the birth of the FASB and the FAF. At the same time, uh, in London, uh, there was a group of globally minded people, um, a fellow called Sir Henry Benson, uh, who was a partner at Coopers and Librand at that time, that said, gee, uh, with the, the beginnings of more global commerce, it would make sense to start to try to create some uh, standards that could be used around around the world. And so for the large part of the next uh, 25 years, uh, the two groups worked. There was some liaison, but not that much. Uh, the predecessor of David's organization, which was called the International Accounting Standards Committee, it was more of a league of nations of part-time representatives. Uh, kind of put together a set of standards of what was really best practices from different parts of the world. Some of them were based on U.S. practices, a lot on U.K. practices, uh, and, and the like. And they also had lots of alternatives. And a lot of countries around the world that didn't have their own standard setting mechanisms, you know, smaller uh, economies, uh, would adopt those, those standards. 
Um, in the meantime, you know, U.S. companies had spread kind of across the globe uh, and their subsidiaries uh, across the globe and uh, our capital markets continued to attract a lot of foreign companies who wanted to raise significant capital. And so U.S. GAAP was also spreading around the world because of that. Um, the, the increasing globalization, I, and you know, this is my own take on things, but I think to a certain extent uh, our winning the Cold War, so to speak, uh, and the development of capital markets outside the U.S. that, you know, outside the U.S. and say the U.K. and a few other places that could actually provide uh, uh, a place for domestic companies to raise significant capital uh, really gave more impetus to the idea of, well, maybe we ought to get serious about creating a single set of of Before we go there, just describe, if you would, this unique model that grew up in the United States and why it was important to the capital markets. Well, the, the model in the U.S., I mean, really came out of the Great Depression, I would say, is that along with all the reforms, uh, including the, the establishment of the SEC and the various banking regulators, uh, the idea came that we ought to have uh, a set of uniform accounting principles and, and disclosure standards and in the public for the public companies, the traded companies, the SEC was given responsibility for both but chose early on to delegate that responsibility to the private sector with with oversight. But really the idea of good disclosure, good accounting being kind of a, a central element of running sound capital markets and capital allocation was really uh, the impetus for that. Now. A lot of it actually, and I actually, as, as, as Susan introduced uh, me, uh, despite my New Jersey accent, uh, I actually studied in the UK and became a chartered accountant. And a lot of the development of the early accounting standards in the US and the, actually the accounting firms really traces their origin back to the UK, uh, to the accounting profession there and the companies acts and the like. But we de then developed our own kind of model of that, which really I think most people have believed have been, you know, really part of the backbone of our capital markets. So this is a private entity, and it's responsible to the SEC, and its funding comes from. Well, the, we're a private sector entity. It, uh, you know, I, it, it's a. Uh, I'd say it's almost somewhere between private and public responsibility. Um, we, for public companies, we have a delegated responsibility from the SEC. For private companies and not-for-profits, that's through general recognition of our standards, including at the, uh, at, at the non-public level, it's actually state boards of accounting, the licensing organizations that say, in our territory, in our state, the standards promulgated by the FASB will be the law of the land, so to speak. Our funding uh, comes largely uh, since the Sarbanes-Oxley Act from uh, a mandatory fee that is levied on all public companies, both registrants and, and, uh, and investment companies, mutual funds, uh, whereby they pay for a share of our annual, annual budget. Uh, and it's, it's done in the same way that uh, the PCOB, the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, which is actually the overseer of the public company auditors. Uh, if you're a CFO of a U.S. company, each kind of March you get an envelope with two bills in it, uh, a large bill for your share of the PCAOB's budget and a much more modest and reasonable bill for your share of, uh, of our budget. So that that uh, is the FASB. And then in recent years, you've been leading a push to create a single uh, global set of standards that would incorporate uh, the United States for the first time, that would apply to the United States for the first time. Talk about how that grew up uh, and, and why that's your goal. Well, uh, perhaps for a start, can I say what a, a pleasure it is to be back here in the colonies uh, to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> to continue sort of the missionary work I've been doing over the last few years. But, At the George Washington <laughs> University, no yeah. less. Yeah. The finest country that anyone ever stole. But the, uh, <laughs> uh, basically, uh, you know, Bob was uh, heading in the, the direction that uh, who gave you the background to our predecessor body and the globalization really started about 1975 because 
previous to that, accounting standards really created in each country. You got the money from your own country, so it had its own rules. When I first became an accountant, there were no standards in the United Kingdom. It wasn't total chaos. You know, the, the firms sort of kept some semblance of order, but we didn't have any uh, until we had a few crises, and that led to uh, the standards coming in. But Bob's absolutely right. 1973, uh, this group started off, and it was uh, a group that ended up with 16 delegations, there were probably 80 people around the table. It met three, four times a year for about four or five days each time, had a staff of five or six, uh, and yet it was supposed to compete with FASB, with the, the seven full-timers, a staff of maybe 40 or 50 at that time. It, there was just no way it would compete. And the gradual move towards international standards, it started first with the multinationals. You know, they had uh, many subsidiaries scattered worldwide. Uh, Sumitomo at the moment have 600 subsidiaries using I4S throughout, throughout the world. And you have to translate all these back into JGAP or US GAP, whatever the parent uh, accounting is. Complete waste of resource. Well, that was the first start of the pressure. But what really got this going was the, the Asian financial crisis. Uh, and you had companies in Asia uh, under their own local standards, and, and they looked fine, and then suddenly they went bust. And a lot of the money had come from this part of the world, and it was just yanked out. It was short term, it was just pulled out. Uh, shortage of capital, interest rates rose, uh, investment stopped, unemployment rose, growth stopped. So we had a major macroeconomic issue in these countries. It would have probably taken them six or seven years to fix their standards. Uh, who was going to trust them having been burned once? So they started looking for a substitute. And there were only two sets of standards, really, that could be a substitute. Uh, the far more advanced US GAAP uh, or the, the somewhat more primitive uh, international accounting standards as they were at that time. And it was actually FASB and the SEC that said that really the world shouldn't take US GAAP in the sense that these were developed for the US markets, it was subject to a US uh, culture, uh, US political pressures, domestic uh, uh, views, and therefore why should this spread uh, internationally? And it was the SEC and FASB who actually set our objective, which is one single set of high quality global standards. Uh, and that's what we were set up to do. We were set up at the end of the 90s uh, and first met in 2001. Uh, and Bob uh, was one of the first board members, one of the founding board members. And it wasn't surprising in a way that the uh, FAF uh, trustees asked for Bob to come back uh, to head FASB because they too saw that if we we're going to have one set of standards, we had to bring the, uh, the two sets together. So the origins of the, the IESB lay in this country. Uh, and uh, that's how it spread. It's not as easy having sort of set UK standards uh, for 10 years. It, it's quite easy to do that sort of thing, at least in a small country like the UK. You, know, you get the uh, auditors on board, you get the analysts on board, you get the, the major companies on board, game over. Uh, now you get the French coming out of left field and uh, the Swiss want something different and, uh, and cultures are different. You know, in, in Europe, for example, in the UK, everything is permitted unless it's prohibited. In Germany, it's the other way around. Everything's prohibited unless it's permitted. In Netherlands, everything's prohibited even if it is permitted. And in France, of course, everything's permitted, especially if it's prohibited. So, <laughs> so you have to deal with these. You're dealing with Japanese, Chinese, and so on, and the US culture. So it, 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 it's quite difficult to do that. And FASB, we meet a lot now together. Um, last month, we met uh, on six uh, days, uh, three face-to-face -face in London. FASB tends to fly because there's five of them and 15 of us. Uh, and the other three were on uh, video uh, links uh, to each other. Uh, and the idea is we're trying to bring these two sets of standards together. Uh, and that's a pretty massive undertaking. And the reason we're doing that is the, um, in the crisis, uh, there was a gradual awareness that we can be picked off. If, for example, a US institution sees something that is weaker in our standards than in US GAAP, they want it imported into US GAAP. And similarly, if uh, our companies see the same in US GAAP, they want us to do that. And there is an academic theory that it's good to have two sets of standards. You know, they'll compete and the best one will win. Don't believe it. Uh, basically, it's a race to the bottom when you've got that. There's regulatory arbitrage, and we both fought against that. Uh, and that's really why we believe the best defense is locking ourselves together so there isn't any gap between us. Uh, and that's really the answer to have one set of standards so it doesn't matter if a transaction takes place in Boston or Brisbane or Beijing, we'll do exactly the same thing.
How, how close are we to that goal today? We're pretty close. Um, we've, um, we started off uh, when uh, Bob took over, it was just after Enron and WorldCom, and the, there was a, a disquiet in the, the US about uh, accounting, and it wasn't really accounting. This was corporate governance failures and fraud. Uh, only a tiny bit of accounting, but the feeling was perhaps you know we should look outside and see what else is out there. But in fact, what we did was uh, somewhat rather different. Uh, we looked at our sets of standards and said, well, if one is clearly better than the other, why doesn't the other one just take it? And we made an agreement in 2002, it must have been just weeks after Bob came into the chair, um, that we would look at the reconciliation which existed at that time. If you listed outside, uh, if you were using standards from outside the US uh, and listed on the New York Stock Exchange, you had to reconcile to US GAAP. So those using IFRS, it was quite easy because all we did is look at these reconciliation, it was income tax consolidations and so on. You could just run down this thing, these are the ones we've got to fix. Uh, and we started comparing the two. And we probably swapped about six each. You know, we took six US standards and uh, FASB amended uh, six of theirs. But it was taking too long. And in 2006, uh, the two boards got together with the SEC and said, how do we get rid of this reconciliation? How have we got to bring these closer together so you feel happy allowing IFRS to just be used on the New York exchanges? And the, uh, the answer was, um, well, let's set up a program. Uh, these are standards that aren't far apart. Few principles are different. Bring the principles in line. Others, um, the standards on both sides are outdated or too complicated. Uh, why don't you, instead of trying to converge and getting a, a converged, outdated, complicated standard, why don't you actually write new ones together? And that's been the real thrust uh, of the last four years. Now, the G20 tells us they would like that finished uh, in the middle of next year. The SEC uh, roadmap uh, for making a decision to whether the US moves towards IFRS is used June 2011 as well. And we're under pressure from those countries that are going to change next year in 2012. They don't want to change twice, so they want this program finished. And the countries that are changing next year, Korea in March, uh, India in uh, June, Japan, who already allow our standards to be used uh, in August, Canada's going uh, in January, uh, and the following year we've got uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, Mexico. So there's a whole lot just don't want to have to switch to IFRS, and then one year later there's another one. Uh, and switching and yet, out. Despite this momentum, there is still an outstanding question about whether the United States is going to participate in this. Talk about why that is. Why is that not a slam dunk? Well, it's, it's, well first of all, I, I, I think the, the U.S. needs to participate in it. Uh, you know, so, some, some people would have the view that, gee, it's kind of like the metric system. We don't need the metric system, uh, even though most of the rest of the world other than some other places like England don't use the, the metric system. Um, but I, I, I think IFRS, that movement needs us, uh, and we need, we need that. Um, we are the largest single capital market in the world, uh, continue to be that. We are the single largest national economy in the world, and we have the richest tradition, I think, of standard setting and the notion of uh, what it's supposed to provide, you know, better transparency for, for investors for the ca capital allocation objective. Uh, and that's not true in, in all parts of the world. And so, uh, you know, I think if you're going to really have a truly set of international standards and not have them, the U.S. be part of that, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a big hole in it. And at the same time, I think that you know, not all aspects of what we do, because we're, we're certainly far from perfect, but what I'll say, the good aspects of our DNA, uh, you know, I believe need to be create, you know, uh, be in that international, st uh, international system. Um, as I said, you know, it was partly the winning of the Cold War and the fact that other economies started to blossom and create their own capital markets and grow like the U.S. Uh, is really, given more and more impetus to this whole, whole movement. And not only, you know, to the, the standards, the accounting standards, but to other aspects of capital markets integration and regulation and the like. And the U.S. being the, the biggest economy in the world really needs to, needs to be part of that.
You, you've raised the concern that other countries may not have the same commitment to independence of accounting standards that the United States has demonstrated over time. Well, we, we, we have a, something of a tradition, at least, which, which often gets attacked. Uh, um, you know, whenever you're in a kind of a rulemaking or legislative uh, capacity, not everybody's going to agree with everything you, you propose. And so we, we, in the U.S., as you've seen, we get attacked from time to time. But every time we get attacked, for example, last uh, fall there was an effort uh, uh, sponsored by the, the American Bankers Association to try to really corral what we, we did through regulatory reform and the response by uh, not only the investment community but the business community uh, was swift against that. Um, because I think in our country we, we do have a good appreciation of the importance of having good accounting, good disclosure, um, and I think that's in part because the, the wealth of our citizenry uh, uh, is, uh, to a large extent, uh, related to their investments directly and indirectly uh, in, uh, in stocks and bonds and, and the like, where that, that's not true in other countries yet. It's beginning to happen uh, throughout the world as the capital markets develop and as saves, you know, savings uh, build up in those countries. And, and the like, but we, you know, we've had the most advanced developed economy and capital market in the world. You depend for funding on contributions from companies, from countries. Uh, a senior European Union official came out recently and said they were going to hold that funding hostage until you changed your uh, structure to include more of the companies that you, uh, that you affect through your decisions. Uh, essentially said, you know, we think that this body needs to be more responsive uh, what, what's your reaction to that? Do you, are you confident that you have a structure that provides you with the independence you need to, to set accounting standards? Yeah, I better ask my diplomatic advisor if I can answer this question. Am I allowed to answer this? But we, I think, Tom, okay, I won't. Uh, right. Um, what I think of it, it's difficult being uh, either polite or honest. Um, basically, I, I think the, uh, one of the, the issues that's emerged is that we set the rules at present for 117 countries and it'll be up to 130 by the end of 2012 and you suddenly find uh, in these countries somebody doesn't like this rule so they, they go to the government and say um, you know what can we do about this uh, who's doing this and they say oh, it's these nerds in London that are uh, making up these wacky ideas and they say well what can we do about it and the answer is nothing you know don't take the standards if you don't like them just don't take them um, and then comes the pressure, well, we should be able to do something. So what we need is more political control. And when you look at the, uh, the FASB, what power has the politicians over FASB? Not a lot, but FASB has its power through the, the medium of the SEC. So technically the SEC could step in. I think it's done it, what, twice, Bob, in 30 odd years or something like that. Um, so what about us? So we discussed the issue of um, governance uh, generally two or three years back. Uh, and the issue for us was uh, we were modelled on the FASB. Uh, we had the, the full-time board, or it's full-time now, of uh, independent people from 10 countries, 15 of us at the moment, going to 16. Uh, we had a set of trustees, uh, five of whom are American, uh, 22 trustees and all from all around the world. Uh, and they selected the board and they got the finance. What was missing was, well, what's the link to the democratic process after that? Because these trustees collectively appointed the successors, uh, you know, as their terms expired. Um, the US had it in the SEC and we had nothing. Well, when we started, uh, we were, in essence, going to be a think tank. Uh, we would just dream up, uh, you know, wonderful standards. And if someone wanted a standard on leasing, they could take that one. But after about two months of starting, the European Commission decided that all listed companies in the European Union should use our standards. Uh, and that made sense because how do you have a single economic uh, market with 27 seven different ways of accounting with the, the different member states? So that went through. But we couldn't really get a, a European SEC. It doesn't exist. Uh, and that would have been a bad thing because we are not the EASB, we're the IASB. And we didn't want a European focus. So as uh, gradually uh, this, these accounting uh, standards spread throughout Asia, 
uh, and Canada and so on, and South America, it began to be a, a way we could actually see that we could set up not a, an SE, global SEC, but we could actually set up a monitoring board which would fulfil the functions of the SEC, making the trust, sure the trustees did their job. Uh, and the individuals that really formed this were the European Commission, uh, the SEC, and the uh, Financial Services Authority of Japan. They, they sort of structured it. Uh, we have a, a memorandum of understanding with our trustees, this is how it works. There are five members of this uh, monitoring board, uh, Mary Shapiro, the uh, uh, Monsieur Barnier, the uh, new EC Commissioner, uh, the Chairman of the Japanese FSA, the Chairman of the Chilean uh, Securities Authority, which is the Emerging Markets uh, representative, and the uh, Chairman of the International Organization of Securities Regulators Technical Committee, who happens to be a Dutchman, and he chairs the whole thing. But these are all political appointments. They've all been appointed by their own governments. Uh, and that links us back in. We're now linked into the US through Mary Shapiro, uh, to uh, Europe through the Commissioner, Japan. And the question now is, is that the right body? Uh, the Basel Committee uh, is an observer. It's a prudential regulator, not a securities regulator. Uh, and it comes to it too. But now the question is, when you heard that sort of comment coming from Europe saying, um, we're going to uh, look at your funding and that will be conditioned on governance. The question is, well, wait a minute, you, you set this thing up. Uh, this is an agreement between our trustees and this monitoring board. Uh, we have to agree this. At least our trustees have to agree this. They don't have to agree it. Uh, if you don't want to stand us, just go and do something else. Uh, on the other hand, it may be there's some very good ideas to come about what should happen to the monitoring board. If the proposals for governments means um, governance means sweeping away the trustees and putting politicians on to tell us what to do, that would be absolutely unacceptable to the SEC. It would also be unacceptable to the Japanese. They wouldn't accept it. I don't think the Chileans would like politicians telling us what to do either. So it, it's not as easy as people sometimes think to say, we're going to force it on you. You know, we're funded at the moment um, mainly by levies. Uh, Britain has levies, Netherlands has levies, Italy has levies on uh, quoted companies. Uh, other countries do it in a slightly different way. Japan has agreed to pay so much and it divvies it up among its major companies. Uh, basically, the trustees have set out... And uh, here, I'm sorry, and here you fundraise, basically. So well, here we find... This is almost the, the relic. Uh, this is how FASB used to be fundraised. Now, we have no power uh, to levy US companies. Uh, that has to be done through the SEC. And the SEC is looking at how it can be done. Now, we have a deficit in our budget of about uh, 2 million at the moment. Most of that, almost all of that, is from the US in terms of its GDP. It's what we call the US gap. Uh, it's, the, uh, <laughs> it's missing. And uh, you guys are making us uh, have salary cuts. Well, not quite, but. Uh, it, this is a bit, we're eating into our reserves at the minute, and we've got to try and fix this. So, but the SEC is working and trying to fix it. Can, and the, can this work without a secured, guaranteed funding stream? Not necessarily. I don't think it can work. You know, ultimately, the, the last thing we want to do is go around and ask companies. Uh, that, that's very in the 20th century now. You want to get levies. Uh, and I think the US will find a way of doing it, partly short term, partly long term. Europe's position is that uh, we at present get, I don't know, something like uh, four and a half, five million euros from uh, the European community. Uh, now the proposal is that the European Commission uh, will su uh, uh, supplant that, but giving us less. Now we don't have to accept that. You know, that they could offer it and we could say we don't want it that way. We're not going to take it with conditions. And certainly I can't see the SEC agreeing to Europe only giving under conditions. So why doesn't the SEC give under conditions and Japan give under conditions? So I just don't think that works. It may be, this is a formula that's been there for two or three years, you know, funding is conditioned on governance. Well, we met all the requirements for governance, so what else do they want? So I think it's still to be explored and uh, there's more to that. But the fact is we're a private sector body, which upsets some people, uh, but nonetheless, uh, if we don't agree, our trustees don't have to accept. Now, we take the consequences. It may be that some funding falls away and we have to try and replace it. Uh, but we don't have to take it. And I think the trustees would not accept money that came with political conditions. The, the, so, account, the accountant in me can't help but uh, uh, 
make the U.S. GAAP a, a U.S. surplus for you. Our, our, our annual budget's, I don't know, something like $25 million, and we've been spending maybe 70% of our time on the international endeavor working with David's folks. So that's about $17.5 uh, million. Now you have a surplus of over $15 million <laughs> in con Congrats, those contributed okay. services. And we haven't charged <laughs> of a time for doing your standards for the you. Europeans might not view it that way, though. <laughs> so accounting standards have uh, economic implications. They have regulatory implications. They have huge public consequences. Why should politicians not be involved in the process? What is wrong well, with a greater degree of public control over something of such tremendous public consequence? Well, there, there's certain elements there to your, your question. Uh, should politicians be involved? Uh, they should be definitely, they should be interested in it, uh, and we welcome that interest in it. As you said, uh, what we do affects companies it affects the capital markets, uh, it affects the economy. Um, and we do that through the pursuit of what's our public policy objective, which is uh, to create sound accounting, transparent disclosure, and the like. And that, that, is, uh, that is our mission. That is our mission under, under the Securities Acts and under Sarbanes-Oxley Act. And it's, it's a sacred mission that we, we've been entrusted with. Um, and I think the politicians uh, ought to be interested in the extent to which we are effectively fulfilling that mission. But of course, uh, sometimes the politicians are interested in us uh, pursuing other missions, sometimes public policy missions or the missions that their particular constituents or special interest groups would like us uh, to pursue. Um, you know. Different industries, different companies are looking to uh, report and portray themselves sometimes in ways that may not that give them a perceived advantage. They they look better than they than they are. They want they want an edge, and sometimes they want the edge through through accounting. Um, bank regulators who also have a very sacred mission, uh, and there's some overlap between what we do, but it's it's quite different. Uh, the financial stability uh, goal and safety and soundness goal that they have is absolutely sacred and critical to the economy as well, uh, but it's not our public policy mission. And so the standards we create, uh, while they can choose to use them, uh, and they often are very suitable for their use, they also have the ability to create uh, their own capital standards and, and regulation and the like. So, you know, to me, it's all about, you know, the, the words, it's all about the economy, stupid. Um, uh, we have a very important uh, public policy goal as part of the economic welfare of this country and working with the ISB more globally as well. But that's the, basically the transparency uh, uh, objective and public policy mission. And that's the one, the one we pursue and we, you know, uh, Independence can never be absolute. It can't be there without accountability, but the accountability ought to be towards the fulfillment of that public policy objective. So you raised the banking industry. That's obviously been the flashpoint in recent times. There's been a lot of pressure on you uh, to adjust accounting standards in ways that would be beneficial to the banking industry. You spent a hugely unhappy day on Capitol Hill about this time last year. I, I actually back. enjoyed it, if you, you can believe oh. that. <laughs> it was painful should, to watch. You, you, should, you, should have seen, you should have seen some of the hearings on expensing stock options a few <laughs> years ago. Those, those got downright personally nasty. So there's been this, this sense among the banks, among their regulators, among many members of yeah. Congress, that accounting standards could be a tool to mitigate the extent of this crisis, to help banks get through it. Yeah. Uh, they've really sought your help in doing that, and in limited ways, you have at times provided it. Uh, what what have you taken away from that episode? What what about well, well that that, that, that episode? Like that? I mean, uh, I, I think it's 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 uh, that particular episode. I think it's it's probably not right to uh, correlate events with the causation of events. I mean, we were already in the process of. Uh, providing some new, more guidance to deal with what was an unprecedented emergency situation where, you know, certain of the fixed income markets just froze up, became inactive, a price discovery was not there, 
uh, valuation became very, 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 very difficult in uh, providing more guidance on how to derive values in, in, in that situation. That work was already underway. The, the folks in Congress, uh, that was in March, I think it was March 12th. The, the stock market hit its low on March 9th, the S&P at like 666. And people were panicking. There was, there was just palpable fear in the halls of Congress at that point. And what they basically uh, asked us to do in uh, no uncertain terms was not telling us what to do, was just get it, get it done. What you need to do is, is accelerate what you were doing. We, I went in there and said, we'll have it in place for the second quarter. And they said, that's not quick enough. And so we responded to that situation, but still while maintaining a very robust due process, in fact, over a two-week comment period, we got 700 letters and met with some 50 groups, particularly investors, and I think it ended up with a better product, particularly much more disclosure uh, around these particular investments and the like. But that, you know, I, I view that that was an appropriate uh, response in an emergency situation. It's probably, I wouldn't want to drink from that fountain on a regular basis. Uh, but, you know, as I said, I think, I think that, that the politicians naturally have an interest in, in what we do. It affects their constituents. It does affect the capital markets and the economy. And we're happy to uh, engage with them and un explain what we're doing, get their input. What I'm not happy to do is for them to tell me, you have to do something that really doesn't serve our, what is our public policy objective. You are now considering an expansion of, of fair value accounting. Uh, banks hate right. this idea profoundly. Yeah. Um, talk about why you think this is uh, this is important. Well, we're we're the, the the model we're about to propose, and it is a proposal. And uh, you know, I've always found that uh, the reason you go through our due process is because you learn a lot through through the input and the engagement of the, of, of people. Um, is that we believe that both cost and fair value numbers are, are relevant. Uh, and we've seen over history, a lot of history, that particularly loans have been a real problem. The accounting for loans has been a real, real problem, uh, particularly in this country, but also in the lost decade in Japan. The SNL crisis, the recent crisis, it, it was not so much the the securities that are, you know, traded on the, the uh, exchanges. Uh, the problem was with loans um, and then loans packaged into securities back, backed by loans. And the current accounting model, uh, the historic cost accounting model with a management um, provision for their expected losses has always woefully uh, uh, lagged behind the reality. Um, We've recently, there's been some academic work done that has looked at uh, over the last 17 years or so since fair value information has been available for loans and other financial instruments. Um, it looked at the impact of, of the relationship, let me put it this way, the relationship between credit risks in banks, U.S. banks across the whole banking sector, uh, and different measures of capital. It looked at uh, regulatory measures of capital, like tier one capital. It looked at um, uh, gap capital, as are under our current model. And then it, 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 it then adjusted those numbers for the fair value numbers that are currently in the footnotes. And across the whole banking sector, uh, and in terms of individual banks also, in, including failed banks that, that failed, um, it showed that, that the least correlated with bank credit risk as measured by credit spreads on their borrowings uh, was regulatory capital. Uh, gap capital was a slight improvement over it, but once you adjusted for the fair value of the assets, the predictive ability and the correlation with, uh, uh, with the credit spreads uh, was was like sixfold. So this is a more accurate depiction of a company's financial health. It 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 it. I believe that I I personally believe it it is. Uh, but our proposal will show both numbers. Uh, 
right. and it actually retain net income the way it is calculated roughly now. Uh, what it will do is w it will show both the management's view of, of the situation, uh, the historic cost of the loans, less their view of credit on a forward-looking basis, but it will also show uh, what, what a market assessment of the loans is as well. Let me just pause and remind the audience that if you have questions, now is the time to write them down and to pass them up so we can collect them. Um, this will increase the distance between U.S. standards and international standards. If this proposal is adopted, it would appear to take us away from convergence rather than towards it. Uh, what do you make of the proposal and how much ground still needs to be covered uh, intellectually in order to get to the same place? Well, we, we uh, had a standard that uh, was derived from the U.S. standards to start with, and uh, it probably mushed together about three uh, U.S. standards on financial instruments. Uh, and I've often said, if, if you understood our standard, you hadn't read it properly. Uh, it was absolutely incomprehensible, and we had huge fights, uh, you know, especially with uh, French banks, uh, and we now operate in a, an atmosphere of mutual trust and understanding with French banks. Oh, nice. uh, they don't understand me, and I don't trust them. You know, they, uh... <laughs> so we basically, in this situation, uh, we um, had a similar thing uh, to Bob, because th there's been a big issue about unlevel playing fields, especially when the world's in meltdown. And we got it first of all uh, in, I think, October 2008. We suddenly discovered that uh, the European Commission were going to put through a law uh, to allow um, European financial institutions to take um, securities out of the, the fair value category into the cost category. Now, under certain situations, rare situations, you could do it in the United States. Uh, and we just suddenly discovered we had five days to do something. And our first reaction was, tell them to go jump in the lake, just go ahead and do it. Um, and then, uh, after discussion with uh, the securities regulators uh, internationally and here, uh, the view was, if we did that, the European markets could spin out of control because there are no rules whatsoever uh, on how to do it. US has very precise rules. You, you have to do it at fair value, there are disclosures, there was nothing. Uh, because we didn't allow it in the first place. So the view would be that you'd get European institutions adding back all their losses, no disclosure, so nobody would know how these companies were doing. Panic would ensue and the market's going to tailspin. That could affect the US markets. So we stepped in. We didn't like it. Uh, we felt tainted by it. Uh, we felt it was a you know, gun to our heads. The alternative of doing nothing was probably worse than doing something, but it wasn't great. So we vowed never again we were going to get into that position. So when uh, you know, Bob appeared in Congress, we could see what was going to happen. Um, and, and sure enough, it did. You know, my fan club, which is the 27 uh, finance ministers of the European uh, Union, uh, summoned me uh, to come and see them and have a nice friendly chat where they shook me warmly by the throat. And uh, <laughs> so we, we had this um, discussion, but we had actually put out uh, a paper saying, look, we could do this, uh, the US did, or we could have a full revision of this standard. What do you want us to do? And we, we tested this in Asia, Europe, uh, and so on. And the view came, change the standard. So when these uh, finance ministers say, we demand you do exactly the same thing, we said, that's not the evidence we're getting back. So we went and uh, we revised it. We simplified the whole standard. Um, we did more outreach on this than probably we've ever done before, because we issued a proposal which more or less said that if you can predict the cash flows, uh, and you hold the uh, instrument to collect those predictable cash flows. And we're really talking about interest and in principal. So it's only debts and loans, uh, debt capital and loans. Anything where it's unpredictable, the exotics, the derivatives, the equities, that has to be at fair value uh, through P&L. So we proposed that. We then went out uh, to over 100 institutions uh, around the world and asked them for their views, uh, where we perhaps got this uh, not quite right and so on. So by the time the exposure period was up, we knew what the reaction was going to be. Uh, and we amended the standard and put it out last November. Now it's been adopted in uh, Brazil, in Japan, China, Australasia, and they're using it. Uh, but the fact that, uh, you know, as Bob said, uh, the income will not be a lot different under US GAAP than it would be under ours. Uh, what we have to try and do is make sure this charge 
that goes in the P&L account, this provision for losses, it is as accurate as we can make it. Now, we're toughening up uh, our uh, loss provision proposals. Uh, Bob's uh, board is going to look at those. We're going to look at his proposals. And the idea, come the autumn, uh, we should try and get a, a common way of dealing with this. Now, the next thing is, what do we do if Bob's uh, FASB go to full fair value uh, and we maintain our split level. Well, we do have a plan B, and the thing is we must make sure as best we can net income is the same. Uh, and all we need to do to get that, assuming we have the same provisioning rules, uh, is that uh, we have to make sure that the instruments that we would have at cost, debts and loans, are the ones that uh, FASB would require to be split into credit losses going through income, which we would show too, uh, and the, the remaining fair value into other other comprehensive income which we wouldn't show but then we could show the fair value of these instruments possibly on the face of the balance sheet so anyone could calculate it in a millisecond mm -hmm. so okay it wouldn't be quite the same but uh, you'd have to be very bad at arithmetic not to be able to get to the answer within a minute you know there's been this broad trend over time toward providing more and more information to investors more iterations which would seem on its face to be a good thing but there's also this basic problem, which Bob just raised a moment ago, which is that if accounting is a language for companies to communicate with their investors the state of their financial health, it doesn't seem to be working very well. We continue to have this problem where companies blink out of existence or suddenly emerge with serious problems, and that has not been apparent in their financial statements. Uh, and, and, you know, we're talking now about a new set of attempts to improve the function of the language and I guess, you know, in closing, before we move to audience questions, I'd just like both of you briefly to reflect on why that has been such an elusive goal and how confident you are that this latest set of changes will bring us closer to that goal. Well, I think uh, as events happen, you, you learn from them. Uh, you have to be a bit of a cynic in this game. You, you, we game our own standards. You know, when you, you write the standards, you think, well, how are the lads out there going to try and cheat uh, and uh, you know, get round it? And uh, we, we obviously try and avoid the anti-avoidance. But one of the things that we are doing, uh, and I think uh, both boards are, are very strong on this now, is that we're trying to write uh, principle-based standards. Now, principle-based standards are harder to get round. Because if, for example, I said, uh, if A, B, and C happens, the accounting's X, well, we know the investment bankers would do B, C, and D and say, oh, it's different. We can have Y. Uh, but if you have a principle and use A, B, and C as an example, you catch anything generically like that and wrap it up. But you have to watch with rules, they know exactly what to do. And they'll jump out of that sandpit and run naked around the beach and we have to put them back in it. Uh, and uh, you know, that's part of the game in a way to see exactly what happens. So we're improving all the time. For example, you probably don't realize the sheer capital that uh, airlines adopt. You know, one of my big ambitions before I die is to fly in an aircraft that's actually on the airline's balance sheet. And <laughs> I told them that'll be his last flight. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the thing is, they lease them. And, you know, our leasing standards are perfectly harmonized. They're absolutely useless. And the, <laughs> the, the reason is that uh, we divide leases. They're, they're both over 25 years old, this standard. It's not Bob's fault or my fault. Uh, but we can have the opportunity to fix them. The leasing industry is about $700 billion a year. Most of it's off balance sheet. But if you see what a loan, uh, a lease is, I promise to pay X per annum for so many years, and I get the right to use this 747 for seven years or whatever. It's not in the balance sheet. I just charge each year what's happening. But I can't get out of that lease. That is a liability, and both boards are adamant that that goes on. Now, that's going to change the gearing of companies enormously uh, and put that on. Uh, and on the other side, the, the asset they're using. Similarly, when we're looking at uh, securitization, you've had the, the Repo 105 situation. Uh, Bob's board tomorrow is looking at proposals that we've developed. Uh, we're asking Bob's board to test them to destruction. Uh, any better ideas, we'll look at them. And uh, so we're really trying to make sure accounting always moves in time. And people will always try and find ways around it. You know, there's, there's always people going to investment banks, can you see, there's the rule, can we get past it? Failing to notice that the objective of financial reporting is a fair presentation. And ultimately, that's what you're after. It's not the rule, it's 
are you interpreting in the spirit of what's there? And if you don't, we can write as many principles as we like. If people don't try and show a fair presentation, we're in trouble. They'll run to lawyers and try and get you know, things done. And one of the problems we have in, in this country, <coughs> I don't know if you've heard, but Harvard uh, Medical School are now using lawyers instead of mice in experiments. And, <laughs> and that's because in the United States, you've got more lawyers than mice. And you know, lawyers will do things that mice refuse to do. And, <laughs> And you get fond of mice, you know. They, uh, but we've got to stop this sort of legal mentality of we're actually there to try and show what happened. And what we do, uh, both boards, is try and show these standards so the accounts do reflect the actual economics. Uh, and that's what we're both straining to do. And OK, sometimes we might got, get it quite right. But I think when you look back at what accounting was 10, 15 years ago and where it is now, it's vastly different, vastly improved. And we're getting more sophisticated. You know, having leases on balance sheets can make a huge difference. Pensions, you know, the pension scheme deficits were smoothed out of the way. And you'd show that if you had a pension scheme of assets <coughs> of 40 million, and liabilities of 40 million, and the assets fell 10 million, you have a deficit of 10, 10 million. But that's not the way we showed them. We sort of said, well, you know, it's a long-term thing. And, and some of that fall will be market noise. You, you measure that at 10%, whatever's the higher assets or liabilities. Well, liabilities are at 40, so you take 4 million off the uh, 10 million, you're down to 6 million. Uh, and of course, it's a long-term thing. Spread that over the working lives of the employees, uh, say 10 years, you end up showing a deficit of 600,000. Now, you explain that to your grandmother. You know, you may as well take the 10 million, divide it by the cube root of the number of miles to the moon and multiply it by your shoe size. It, <laughs> it doesn't mean a thing. And, and yet that was how accounting was. Now, FASB changed that a year or so ago. We are changing it this year. Um, in the UK, they did it that way for the last 10 years. But that's how accounting is developing. You would actually, companies are only now discussing the major deficits they've got because we didn't account for them properly. So let me put the same question to Bob if I can. Obviously, we're dealing with many of the problems that emerged during this last crisis. Are we getting ahead of the curve? Is principle-based accounting a way of getting ahead of the curve, uh, as David has described it? Well, let me, let, me, let me go back to your basic question, and I agree with uh, a lot of what David said. I mean, I think there, there are uh, a number of factors. One is, David pointed to, um, uh, people just uh, disrespect, violate the rules, cheat. I mean, that, that's not something that as standard setters we can directly deal with. That's up, up to other people, enforcers and, and, and the legal. Uh, 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 you know, you can set rules or laws, but people do violate them, and that that continues to happen. And that you know, they do it. Uh, um, you know, they do it because they perceive a risk reward in in in, in doing that. Um, that will that that'll always be the case. It will always continue. Um, the the second thing is that, as David said, uh, accounting has lagged the economics. Accounting standards. Uh, I feel very strongly that, to that effect. And, and every time we try to uh, move accounting towards economics, there's a huge fight. Um, there was a fight over stock options, counting those as, ex as part of compensation. There was a huge fight uh, back in the 80s when the FASB first said, uh, you're going to have to uh, account for your pension liabilities and for your health care post-retirement health care liabilities. Uh, uh, you can't just do it on a pay-as-you-go basis. These, these are real liabilities, and the companies that were most affected, the auto companies, the smokestack companies, uh, said these are not real liabilities. Well, 20 years later, we know they were real liabilities. We know there are real liabilities at the states. We know that, that the, the government's social liabilities are are, are real liabilities. Uh, I think we're going through some of the, the same aspects right now with, with the idea of how to measure s certain financial assets. We're going through some of the aspects that David said with, you know, showing leases on balance sheet as, as commitments uh, and, and, and the like. And so there has been, uh, to my way of thinking, uh, a slow catching up of, econom of accounting to the underlying, uh, the underlying economics, and 
You have to remember that the financial statements consist of several statements. There's a cash flow statement, which show the actual cash flows for the period. There's an income statement, which shows what was earned during the period, but there's also a balance sheet. The balance sheet has been the weakest sister of all those three statements historically. It's been kind of just the residual of, of what the income statement has been, and there's been a reluctance to kind of measure things uh, at current value rather than historic costs and allocations of historic costs and, and, things, like, and things like that. Um, the third factor, getting to the, the financial crisis, no accounting can deal properly with a, syst with, with a situation where uh, no one knows uh, what the value of particular assets are. You take a CDO or a CDO squared, and when the trading stopped, and you look at those instruments, uh, thousands of loans underlying the basic CDO, and then pieces of those rearranged in a very complex structure with derivatives embedded in it, uh, and there's no standardized information underlying that. In order to do any valuation, whether you call it a current value or you do you know, what you think your credit losses are going to be, you have to be able to project future cash flows or ranges of cash flows. And the fact that there was no infrastructure uh, supporting those markets, uh, that was the biggest crime, in my, you know, along with others, the poor underwriting and the rating and all of that. But accounting, uh, accounting struggles in that kind of situation because you don't know how to account for those things other than cash as it comes in, and that's, that's very unsatisfactory. Mm -hmm. So turning to audience questions, because this one is, is relevant, you know, even before the crisis, there obviously were, were issues with, with the way that accounting uh, was conducted by these companies. So a first question from the audience, do you have plans to look into the accounting issues raised in the Lehman Report uh, as the SEC is doing? And I know you just touched on, on the ways that you're addressing this, perhaps go into a little bit more depth about it. Well, the, 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 the SEC's uh, in the middle of a large inquiry process, uh, what they call your CFO letters. Um, they've sent letters to the, all the major financial institutions over the uh, past few weeks trying to understand uh, whether Lehman was a one-off or it was broader. Um, if it was a one-off, uh, then, you know, maybe we have something where, in that situation, a company that was in, in trouble chose to, uh, uh, chose to make itself a little, look a little better than maybe it was. Uh, and, you know, that ought to be dealt with through those processes. If, if in fact, uh, people were uh, more broadly uh, interpreting the accounting rules and even the disclosure requirements in the same way, then there's, then there's, there's stuff for us to do. Mm. You agree? Absolutely. Oh. Uh, the joint projects FASB and IASB are addressing are on a fast track. Why? Well, the, uh, we've been looking at these projects since uh, about 2006, uh, and I, I think the crisis uh, made governments aware that uh, accounting really mattered. And you started finding governments... Uh, we, we even discovered, for example, that... Uh, President Barroso of the uh, European Union, uh, Angela Merkel, um, President Sarkozy, and uh, President, uh, Prime Minister Berlusconi actually spent half an hour discussing our financial instrument standard. Now, I'd have loved to listen into it, but the, um, <laughs> you know, it's amazing you get heads of state uh, are actually involved in these things. And we get heads of state writing to complain about us. Uh, but I, I think what it did do, it alerted uh, people to the, the issue that uh, accounting really had to depict what Bob was just talking about, the, the economics. And sometimes the answers can be very, very uncomfortable. Uh, and that's where we almost go right back to where we started in the beginning. Sometimes people don't want to see the uncomfortable numbers. Um, in the crisis, there was great temptations for politicians to say, if you can just hide this, you know, with a bit of luck, it'll all come good. And we had that before in the, the sovereign debt crisis. That was hidden because accounting was very primitive in those days. But you had some banks that, quite frankly, were bust. If we'd have been brutal, we didn't exist at that time, and neither did Bob. Well, Bob existed, but he, not in his present role. Right uh, but, 
But it, the, the sort of thing there was that you, you had banks full of these sovereign debts. Nobody expected countries would default, but they did. And had we say, right, write them down, bang, now, uh, then you would have had a situation where a, a lot of our major banks were bust. So the, the regulatory authorities said, well, why don't we just allow you to write them off at you know, this formula over a period of years? And that's what happened. And their argument then, phew, that saved our banks. And the, the question is, and you know, Bob would almost certainly support this, what if we started showing what the market had thought of those banks? Would they have kept lending? Uh, these loans, rather. You know, if you lent to this South American country and it was at 100 and now it, the market showed it was 95, would you keep lending when it had gone down to 80? Uh, knowing that the, the market was expecting a 20% loss. Uh, so there are signals uh, and, and they weren't missed. And I think part of the issue now is uh, how do we get to a situation where we can reflect that? It's going to be uncomfortable and can people accept it? As Bob said, the trouble with accounting, getting it back to the economics, is people often don't want it at the economics. Uh, and that's where we have to try and you know, get the herd moving gently in a westerly direction without stampeding the thing. And it's not easy to... We're in change management. That, that's our job. Uh, and that is quite hard because we're salesmen, ultimately. We're not just producers. We've got to sell this thing. And we've got to persuade people this is the right answer you know take this it's tough it's hard but it's good for you but my bonus is tied to this year's profit not next year's I want, don't want this number and that's when the pressures come in and that's where we had the issues on share based payments and all these issues you're gracious enough not to name any of those banks Citigroup of course is the preeminent example and it has been raised as a question what would have happened had market discipline been imposed on that company uh, in the late 1980s, uh, what would they have been doing over the last 20 years differently than they were? Um, but underscoring the importance of, of accounting standards brings us to this next question. Bob, why should the U.S. give up control of something so important as accounting standards? And because you've talked a little bit about why you think that is a good idea, could you also address how you think you might be able to overcome what is probably very widespread hesitations uh, about this idea? Yeah, uh, and, and you know, I, I think it's a good idea, but I also think we need to do it right. Um, uh, the the long-term cost-benefit to us, I think, is can be significant, but the short and medium-term cost-benefit is harder to see because we already have a pretty good system, uh, and you know, from the company's points of view they view as a lot of change, cost in the system and, and the like. People are used to that. Now, our convergence efforts can mitigate those costs because the closer we come together, uh, the less the switching cost and, and the like. Um, but it's got to be done, done right. Um, and that's why I said that I think it's, it's important that we be part of this system with our heritage and our experience and our tradition of trying to have, you know, as independent as possible capital markets standards, information for, for investors, uh, because it's important because we are going to continue to be a major part of the world economy in dealing with and trade and capital flows and M&A with all sorts of other parts of the world. And, and therefore, it, 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 it means a lot to all our citizens, our investors, that we have a good global capital market system and that we have that supported by good reporting and good, good accounting. Um, so, you know, you're never going to have, in a, in a global situation, you're never going to have control. That won't work. That, in part, seems to be what Europe tries to do with, with David and, and the party. So you have to create a structure that is consonant with, with the market that it serves. Uh, if we're going to have global capital markets, you have to have global capital structures. We need to be a very important uh, part of that, an important seat at the table, and you know, make sure that, that uh, our interests are, are served without dictating to other people. And that's a fine balance in any kind of international endeavor, but it, it's the way the world's going. Does the, does the U.S. risk losing market share, as it were, if everyone else adopts uh, a system that is as trusted and as successful? Well, that, that's, you know, that's always the, you know, that's the, the, the protectionist kind of view of, of, of life. Uh, I've lived in various parts of the world, uh, 
And I do, I do believe in, in getting to global solutions where we can as long as they're balanced uh, and they're, they're, they're crafted with everybody's input. Uh, they may not perfectly, they're not going to serve each individual country or, or, or group exactly like they like, but I do believe that they will rise, they will create a rising tide all over economically and that, that, that will be to our long-term benefit, sure. They're going to be short-term losers. There's no doubt. We, we, we see that in industries as things shift and the like. But it, it, it's very hard to keep, to turn back those tides. You basically have a year to convince Mary Shapiro that this is a good idea. How do you do that? I don't think we need to convince Mary it's a good idea. I think she uh, believes it's a good idea. I think what we have to try and do is uh, do exactly what Bob said. We, we're in a situation where we have uh, a plan. Uh, it's now part of the SEC roadmap. People want us to finish this, uh, and they want us to finish it within 15 months. That, that's a tough call. Uh, the boards, the, the efforts that have gone into it, the, the fact that uh, Bob's team is flying across every second month virtually to London, uh, and we spend uh, best part of a week uh, discussing it. It's made a huge difference. Previously we discussed it, some other time Bob would discuss it, and, and then we'd think, gee, we don't get the same answers. Then we have to have some phone calls and things between us. Doing it all together has speeded the whole process up. And we have to try and make sure the answers we get are of a, a quality that is a, a big improvement of what we've got, uh, and high quality standards. And the fact is, the rest of the world, uh, it's almost the antithesis of the question you, you just asked Bob. You know, the ISB firmly believes that the US has a central role to play in all this in the future. But it is hard uh, when you're a, a sovereign country to say, well, you know, I, I control this at the moment. Why, why should I give this up? And, and that was the same in Britain. It was the same in Australia, the same in Japan. People don't like it. Uh, and it's putting it into the common good. And they do that because there are advantages in it. Uh, the US world capitalization is falling. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the share on the world capitalization of the US, eight years ago it was 52% of the stock exchange capitalizations worldwide. Now it's 35. At least it wasn't 2008, it's probably less now. It's Asia that's growing. And, but the US, as Bob said, has the tradition. The, the Anglo-American tradition, which is part of the reason we fight with Europe, because they don't have that, uh, is very, very strong in accounting. And we need the US in there. And the U.S. is, well, North America is guaranteed, out of the 16 board members, is guaranteed at least four. Europe, four. Uh, Asia, Oceania, four. Latin America, one. Africa, one. And two floating. And you will have a major core in that. Once you've made the decision to come in, and I think, frankly, the U.S. will make the decision uh, in due course next year sometime, um, you will have time to get ready for it because it'll be 2015, unless you're a multinational and there's an option given and you go early. Uh, the other aspect of it is the rest of the world is tired of the convergence program. We think it's absolutely essential that we bring US GAAP and take the best of US GAAP uh, into the international community. But if you're someone in some other country uh, outside saying, well, why is this favored nation status? You know, wh why not us as well get involved with it? And the answer is because there are two main sets of international standards, one US GAAP and one's international GAAP. Other standards don't even come anywhere near that. And the obvious thing is to bring the, the two together. But there is resentment. And, you know, if the US doesn't want to do it, get them out. I mean, we hear that all the time, and we're ignoring it. Uh, change your work program, drop some of the subjects, do this instead, because I want this done. Why should we wait? Well, the reason we should wait is the prize is enormous. You know, this is probably a one-in-a-generation chance of doing what the SEC and the FASB set out for us 10 years ago, one single set of global standards. And I often liken to the fact when I was at school, I used to play in goal for the uh, school football team. And in a cup semi-final, we're winning one nothing in the last few minutes, and this forward broke through and he hit the ball so hard, it went past me before I could move. Uh, fortunately, I hit a post and rebounded to him, and he hit it first time, and this time I threw myself to the left and turned the ball around the post. <laughs> And my teammates were absolutely ecstatic. Uh, what they didn't realize, I was trying to save his first one. And uh, Here in the colonies, we call it soccer. Yeah, soccer. No, oh, we don't. We gave that up. Uh, and, uh, the, but we won't get another chance at this. You know, if this fails, 
it won't just be US GAAP and IFRS. I can see it fracturing. You know, you'd get, why should Japan come in? Why should Latin America? They have to make their mind that the whole thing could blow apart. That, and that's a big problem. And that, that, that's, that's part of the tension here is that, that uh, you know, other countries in the world want to come in, and David said, do not want to change twice, uh, yet we have to get this right. And I would hate to think that for the sake of six months or a year, uh, we would get it wrong because the standards we're going to create could be in place for many, many years. And we have, we have to make sure we've given it our, our best shot. And that's why we're, we've intensified our processes and we're going to intensify our engagement processes. But I do have some concerns about, uh, certainly in the U.S. perspective, we are tossing out there something like eight, nine, ten proposals all at once on revamping uh, just the most major sections of accounting uh, practice and all of that. And uh, the ability to get, get the standard right, as I said, really depends on getting good input. There's, yeah. a, there's a sort of elephant in, in the room. We've not mentioned its name at all tonight, but it's China. Um, emerging economy, growing capital markets, increasing role in all of this. How do, how do they fit in? Well, in 2007, uh, China dropped its uh, communist-style standards and uh, they adopted, but not quite adopted, uh, IFRS in the sense that they took the principles out of IFRS, put them in the law, uh, and then took the remainder and made it mandatory guidance from the Ministry of Finance. Now, the deal is you get the same answer, and through Hong Kong, we're checking, it, and they do. Uh, virtually. There's one or two small bits, not major, but the answer is, and we're saying to China, you've really got to go word for word. They, they have a yeah. little bit of a Chinese menu approach yeah. um, in that they, they take the IFRS standards, uh, tailor them to the Chinese situation. They've taken a few of our standards and tailored them to the Chinese situation. Uh, uh, they seem right now to kind of like that approach of kind of being, you know, I'll call it almost hurts. <laughs> so we now have three international standards. Well, we're not in, in no, it, it's pretty close to, I mean, the, 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 the thing you also have to recognize is that a lot of the international standards that, that David inherited in his uh, book of standards were actually crafted from U.S. standards. Yeah. The, the Chinese quoted companies, uh, Bob's right, they, they took the best of the Chinese, the uh, American standards, but we took them too. Uh, and so that uh, the, the quoted uh, Chinese companies are pretty well in IFRS. Not some of the others, but the quoted ones uh, are pretty well there. And we, we're telling them too that they're, they're looking at sort of keeping up to date all the time. It is much easier if you adopt, because otherwise there may just be a question mark, you're not quite there. And moving on to... Um, the, the changes that they're going to have to make uh, as this program moves through. You know, one of the things that we uh, have always said, the giving advice, and I'm always reluctant to give advice. I remember when I moved to my present home in Edinburgh, there was a rather unusual plant in the front garden which uh, looked like overgrown parsley, but the, the neighbours who didn't like the lifestyle of a previous occupant thought was marijuana. And uh, I was a bit concerned about that, so I called in a horticulturist, and he gave me advice I never forgot. He didn't know what it was either, but... Uh, he said, look, if you're worried about this plant, he said, pick it, dry it, and smoke it. And if you're still worried about it, then it's parsley. Um, <laughs> but the, 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 advice that we, the advice we give companies, uh, countries is take the standards. Uh, we have uh, in our constitution a rule that two years after implementation, if we discover problems, we'll come back and look at it. Now, by that time, the cohort of board members that were there originally will have changed slightly. There'll be new ideas in their experience of what's happened. We can change it again. So, you know, our view about the 2011 thing is we can make massive differences. The leasing standard, hugely different. Pensions on balance sheet. Uh, consolidations, control, not 50% plus one of equity. You know, there's major changes. Now, maybe at the edges we could improve them further and we can still keep doing that. And that's really what this is about. It's moving the game forward, dealing with the things that you're talking about with people who are coming in and playing games best we can, stop them. But that also needs good auditing and it needs good regulation. So we're only one of a three-legged stool, one leg of a three-legged stool. 
but we've got to keep the game going forward and, and that's really our role in the meantime. Okay. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been a wonderful discussion and I think you can, as you can well imagine, uh, we could probably go on all night and, um, but I'm going to intervene at this time and thank uh, thanks to David Tweedy and Bob Hers for coming and sharing with us sort of the state of the discussion on uh, international accounting standards. And uh, please join me in thanking them. Uh, we have a plaque for each of you to commemorate uh, your participation in the uh, Robert P. Maxson Lecture. And there's also a permanent plaque that resides in uh, the business school and your names will be added, uh, will be added to that. So thank you both thank you. very much for joining us. And ladies and gentlemen, please come back next year for the 12th Robert P. Maxson Lecture. Thank you very much and good evening. <laughs>